Great teachers and poor teachers, one of the biggest differences is willingness to repair. Great teachers seldom, if ever, do anything they ever need to repair. They don't argue, they don't use sarcasm, they don't yell. But you want to know what's really amazing about a great teacher? They seldom, if ever, need to repair, and they're always working to repair. Ineffective teachers consistently do things they need to repair, but seldom, if ever, do they ever repair. You want to know how you know it's a truly great teacher? A truly great teacher walks into class on Wednesday and goes, class, I'm sorry if I was a little impatient yesterday. I wasn't feeling very well. Do you know how you know it's a great teacher? Because do you know what the kids say? They don't say that's okay, not if it's a great teacher. You know what the kids say? I don't even know what you're talking about. The teacher didn't need to repair, but they're always working to repair. Ineffective people constantly need to repair, but seldom, if ever, do they ever repair. When I wrote the book, Dealing with Difficult Parents, one of the things that I wanted to do was talk about repairing because of how important that is. The best way to get in the last word is to apologize. One of the most powerful things we can do is to apologize. Realize in every school represented here today, you have some people that will never admit they're wrong. Did you all know that? Sitting in this auditorium, besides me even, there are people in here that will never admit they're wrong. What I've learned in those circumstances, I don't try to get them to admit they're wrong. You know why? Because they never will. But what I've learned we can do where we don't have to admit they're wrong, but we can still repair, is to say, I'm sorry that happened. I sorry that happened. I sure I'm sorry that happened. I wish that hadn't happened. I apologize that happened. I'm sorry that happened. Do we have any second grade teachers here? Do you all have recess duty? You're outside on recess duty. The nicest second grade girl in the school is running across the playground. She trips, she falls, her skins her knee. No one tripped her and there's not a problem with faulty playground equipment. Are you sorry it happened? Did you trip her? No, but you're sorry it happened. Anybody ever had a kid, uh, student cheat on a quiz or a test or a homework assignment? Are you sorry it happened? Darn right, does that mean there isn't consequences? What does it mean? You're sorry it happened. Student doesn't have homework. Student isn't prepared for class. Student's late for class. Are you sorry it happened? Did you know I have never dealt with a belligerent parent that I wasn't sorry it happened? <laughs> Anybody here ever dealt with a belligerent parent? You ever dealt with a belligerent parent that you weren't sorry it happened? I have never dealt with a belligerent parent that I wasn't sorry it happened. When I suspended a student as a principal, every time I suspended a student, and I suspended hundreds during the time I was a principal, you know what I told every principal, every parent when I suspended them? I'm sorry that happened. I sure wish that hadn't happened. I apologize that happened. Did I say we're wrong? What did I say? I'm sorry that happened. And did you know if we don't practice that under times when we're not under duress, there's no chance it'll roll off our tongue when we are under duress? I have never dealt with a belligerent person that I wasn't sorry it happened. Now remember, we're the filter. When the teacher sneezes, the whole class catches a cold. We're the ones that determine what comes in our classroom and what doesn't come into our classroom. And in my mind, I am thinking plenty of things I choose not to filter in. Well, I'm saying I'm sorry that happened. I wish that hadn't happened. In my mind, I'm thinking I'm a little sorry that happened, because otherwise I wouldn't be dealing with you. And every once in a while, I think I'm a little sorry you ever moved into our school district. And I'll be honest, every once in a while I'm thinking, I'm a little sorry you ever conceived. But I sure am sorry that happened. I wish that hadn't happened. I apologize that happened. But we decide what comes in and what goes out. Another thing that is critical for all of us to do, we talked about not giving away power to negative people, and we have got to stop giving away power to negative people, and we have stopped, got to stop giving away power to negative peers. I'll give you an example. Last summer I was asked to do a week-long workshop with a school during the month of July. This particular school had uh, 45 teachers, and they asked their teachers to attend a week-long workshop during the month of July voluntarily with no compensation. This particular school had 45 teachers, and this particular school had 42 teachers attend that workshop. What do you only go those percentages? You know what that school is full of, don't you? A whole bunch of dedicated, caring professionals exactly like yourselves. You know the other thing that school is full of, don't you? A whole bunch of teachers I spent one week wish, wishing my kids had. You know the other thing that school is full of, don't you? A whole bunch of teachers I wish every one of your kids had. One time I have a group of teachers for a week, especially if it's July, especially if they're not getting paid, we try to spend the first hour, hour and a half just doing fun things. And I'm sure right now a couple of you are thinking, could you get to one or two of those? Anyhow. <laughs> We went an hour and, 15 minute, hour and 15 minutes, took a break, and a teacher came up to me and said, you know, this is good. But the people who need to be here, 
Were you all at that workshop? <laughs> How'd you all know that? Oh, one or two of you have heard someone else say that before. Possibly even looking around, one or two of you may have said that before yourself. Teacher said, what should we do? I said, I'll tell you exactly what we should do. I'll tell you what each and every single one of us needs to do. Every single one of us needs to praise the Lord. Because if they walked in now, would your week be better? Or would your week be worse? Would you pull up a chair and say, sit over here by me? <laughs> sit over here by me? <laughs> no. You'd put on a garlic necklace and hold your fingers in a cross, wouldn't you? <laughs> but you want to know power? We were willing to give away the power to those three people to ruin our week, and they weren't even there. And we've got to stop, and we've got to stop now. And it's the same way with parents. A few years ago, I happened to be affiliated with a school. And the second to the last day of school, an elementary school, they sent a note home with 900 students. And the second to the last day of school, this note said, Dear parents, you must, must was all bold. Instantly, I knew this was an incredibly essential note. You must pick your children up promptly anytime there's an away field trip and the field trip buses return after the regular buses have left. If you do not, all capital, all italics, all underlined. I read that one sentence, I had to change my underwear, I was such a nervous wreck. <laughs> if you do not, your child could be placed into after-school daycare and you could be charged up to $2 an hour. 900 families, how many do you think that note was written for? Three, four, maybe half a dozen. And you know what's funny? It was written for the half a dozen people who are least likely to read the note. And somebody decided that it was okay to insult 794 people to try to get revenge on six. Somebody decided it was okay to do that. And of course, the reason I know that note was a threat because there were consequences. And people like Todd Whitaker always weigh the consequences. I read that note and I go, $2 an hour. This is great. <laughs> I am never picking my kids up. Matter of fact, I'm going to drop Harrison off at that school on my way to work. And it's being aware of that in terms of what we do and making sure we do not give away power to negative people because they have no power until we hand it to them. You know, we were talking about every time you praise at least how many people feel better? Two. And one of them's who? You. And what's one thing you can do at work anytime you want and you'll feel better? Praise somebody. It's amazing. But do you know the single biggest determinant of how much we praise? The single biggest determinant of how much every person in this room praises is how we feel about ourselves. Because if we don't like ourselves, we can't stand anybody else running around happy either now, can we? So who is the first person that you have to take care of? Yourself. That's exactly right. I haven't taught you anything today. Did you all know you already knew all this stuff? But one of the challenges is once in a while we forget about it. Once in a while we lose focus because somebody tells us something that's incorrect and we lose concentration on our core. You know, it's funny, there's lots of reasons I wrote what great teachers do differently. One of them is I want to pull the covers off the ineffective people. I don't want them ruining our schools anymore. But you know another reason I wrote what great teachers do differently? Because if you don't make it clear this is right and this is wrong, do you know which teachers in a school start to doubt themselves more than any other teachers? The best teachers in the school. You know why? Because nobody else tries as hard. Nobody else cares as much. Nobody else puts in that effort. And they start to think maybe the problem's them. But when great teachers hear, we don't argue, we don't yell, and we don't use sarcasm, you know what great teachers think? I knew that was right. I knew that was right. I knew that was right. And they're full speed ahead. Because they're the ones that are going to pull, be pulling our wagons anyhow. And they understand that. So you have to take care of yourself. And there's lots of ways to do that. One way is obviously praise. Another is exercise. A lot of people, it's, it's exercise. Some people, it's reading a certain book or watching a certain movie. For me, that movie's It's a Wonderful Life. Are you all familiar with the movie It's a Wonderful Life? And you know what the challenge is for me with It's a Wonderful Life? It isn't watching it at Christmas when I'm in a good mood. You know what the challenge is? Is watching it during the middle of the year when I'm not. I've learned if I'm throwing a pity party and I'm the only invited guest, if I can sit my rear end down in front of the TV, put in It's a Wonderful Life, two hours and 15 minutes later, I've had my cry and I'm good to go for two months. But we also need something at work. And one of the things everybody needs at work is what I call an attaboy or an attagirl file or an attaboy or an attagirl drawer. 
Do y'all know what an attaboy or attagirl file or drawer is? It's a place where you keep positive things. It may be comments from students, notes from parents, from the principal, from each other. Maybe a column from Reader's Digest. But the challenge in education isn't accumulating things in our attaboy and attagirl file. Do you know we're blessed in education? We have more opportunities to put things in our attaboy and attagirl file than any other profession. You know what's in most professions attaboy file? A paycheck stub. But the challenge for us in education isn't accumulating things. We're very blessed that way. The challenge for us in education is when we least feel like it, taking things out and reading them. And I just want to share with you a story from my attaboy file. And it was from my first year whenever I was a principal up in Hopkins, Missouri. I was high school principal and varsity boys and varsity girls basketball coach. Kind of an unusual combination, but I really liked it. The basketball season was starting out, and I had a student named Bob Fiddler come up to me and ask me if he could be on the varsity boys basketball team his senior year up in Hopkins, Missouri. Bob asked me if he could be on the varsity boys basketball team his senior year. See, and you need to know a couple things about Bob. One is Bob was labeled mentally retarded. Be some other label now, it just depends on what state you're in. Every state labels all the handicaps in different things. Bob asked me if he could be on a varsity boys basketball team his senior year, and I told Bob Fiddler I would love to have him. Because, see, I thought it'd be good for Bob Fiddler. I thought it'd be good for the rest of the team, and I thought it'd be good for our whole school, and I thought it'd be good for our entire community. So Bob Fiddler, his senior year, is on the varsity boys basketball team up in Hopkins, Missouri. Some other things you might want to know about Bob Fiddler, in addition to his mental handicap, Bob Fiddler was five foot six, horribly uncoordinated. He couldn't pass, he couldn't dribble, and he couldn't shoot. The only basketball-related skill he had at all was the ability to foul. <laughs> and in addition, Bob was on what we like to call the flex practice schedule, which meant he would come to practice depending on which episode of Gilligan's Island was being rerun on TV that afternoon. Well, as you can imagine, Bob didn't really fit in. See, Bob was always treated very differently because Bob had always been treated very differently. But something happened that changed Bob Fiddler's life. I think probably changed every player on that team's life, and I promise you it changed Todd Whitaker's life. Because, see, one of the things I used to do, instead of having a varsity boys practice over the holiday season, one of the varsity boys practices right before Christmas, instead of having a practice, I used to load all my players up on a school bus. And I'd personally drive that school bus around to all the retirement centers in the community. And we'd go into those retirement centers, and we would sing Christmas carols. Now, I realize that's not much, and I'm sure here that every single sports team, club, group, and organization does at least that much to give back to the community. But you all can imagine what 16, 17, 18-year-old boys singing in public was like, can't you? They'd be lined up behind me with their heads down going, and I'd go, hey, guys, we're in a retirement center. Nobody in here can hear. I will tell you this, my mom doesn't think that joke's near as funny as she used to, let me tell you. <laughs> but this year we had Bob Fiddler. And Bob stood right up in front, God bless me, merry gentlemen, let took the pressure off everybody. Best year of singing we ever had. But more important than that, Bob fit in because you see Bob had contributed. One other thing we used to do around during that time, we'd always pull out the goals we set as a team at the start of the year to see if we needed to change any of the goals, or add to them, or delete them. And every once in a while at that point in the year, we'd need to add a, delete a goal that said undefeated season, or something like that. And this year, the team told me, they said, Coach, we were talking in the locker room, and we have decided that we want to add one goal this year. We want to add the goal of getting Bob Fiddler a basket in a game. And I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, well, that's not much of a goal. Let me tell you. First two months of the season, my goal was getting Bob a basket in practice. In addition to his lack of skills, Bob would foul so much. Typically, his line score would read, three minutes played, four turnovers, five fouls, and he'd be out of the game. And the other problem was Bob just couldn't get open. I'd put Bob in the game. Bob would check into the game. The other team would see Bob and instantly know something was up. And they'd see we were trying to get Bob the ball. So I'd put Bob in the game, and all five of their players would circle Bob like an old Western movie so that Bob could never get the ball. And Bob literally ran like, this is Bob, run, he ran like he was underwater. <laughs> so the season went along, and the season was over, and Bob, Bob didn't get a basket. And uh, matter of fact, Bob didn't even get a shot off. And the season was over, except for one game. We had our last home game, and I told my guys, hey guys, this last home game, we are starting 
are five seniors. And one of those five seniors was Bob. And we got a big lead that game, which was unusual that year because we were just 12 and 13. We got a big lead, so I put Bob and the subs in. And what was their goal? I put Bob and the subs in. And what was their goal? Give Bob a basket. And the problem is Bob just couldn't get open. I didn't know what to do. Season's almost over. The game's almost over. The clock's running down. So I call timeout, and I say, guys, here's what we're going to do. You four, you all are going to be down here playing defense and rebounding. And Bob... Bob, you're going to wait underneath our basket for them to throw you the ball. We break the huddle. Bob goes out underneath the far basket, and Bob's hands up. The referee thought that he had a question. <laughs> but see, I taught Bob. I said, Bob, when you're open, put your hand up. So Bob's down here. He's open. His hand's up. His arm gets tired, and he has to put the other hand up. And literally, he's down here rotating arms, and each time his hand gets up a little less high than it could the time before. He's down here waiting for the ball and bless these players' hearts. They're playing defense and rebounding the best they know how. Finally, they'd get the rebound and they'd turn around and they would whip the ball down court. And you need to understand, they were subs for a reason. <laughs> and one of those reasons was they couldn't really throw. Wasn't an impediment because Bob couldn't really throw catch. That's right. They throw the ball too hard and it'd skip off the ground and hit Bob in the knee and go out of bounds. Or be right at his chest and it'd be so hard it'd bounce off his chest and go out to half court and the other team would get it. I know at the end of that game Bob had basketball marks on his chest from trying to catch the ball. Because you know what I realized during that game? I realized that in order for Bob to catch the ball, somebody was going to have to throw him a perfect pass. Any of you ever had any students that have been in your classroom that in order for them to catch the ball, somebody's going to have to throw them a perfect pass? And do you know if the people in this room do not throw that perfect pass, you have some students that are never going to catch it. So I called timeout and put four of my starters back in. And what was their goal? Give Bob a basket. Bob literally down here just looks like a seal. He can barely flap his hands now. He's tired from trying to hold them up. These four players are playing defense and rebound. They get the rebound, they take off dribbling, and a funny thing happened. The other team stopped crossing half court. Literally, nine players had lined up right here at the half court line. It was like the old girls' three on three games they used to play. And they'd stop right here and they'd throw Bob the ball. And Bob would get the ball and he'd shoot on this side and miss, and get the rebound and shoot on this side and miss. And the rebound would hit his foot and go out of bounds. <laughs> and the crowd is going crazy. And at the buzzer, literally at the buzzer, Bob Fiddler scored. And I know for a fact the timekeeper held the clock. Because <laughs> most high school games are over before 2.15 in the morning, aren't they? Well, we had a weekly newspaper in Hopkins, Missouri, called the Hopkins Journal, and the editor at the time was named Jim Lohman. And uh, Jim Lohman used to write a column each week called Low Man on the Totem Pole. And when I wrote the book Teaching Matters, I had a chance to get in contact with him because I wanted permission to reprint his column that came out that next week. And I want to share with you the column that came out the next week. I know that this is going to come as a surprise to you, but underneath Rugged's John Wayne Shell, he was talking about himself, he's kind of a big guy, is the body of a marshmallow. The meaning of all this is I can remember my big hit in Little League, my great catch, my great basketball game where I scored 10 points, my three high school wrestling wins, one a year for three years, including the win over the boy I told the match was over, <laughs> he rolled off and I jumped on him. and the time I accidentally need a kid in a tender spot. These aren't even as, uh, as great as they seem to be as they are all in intramural competition. See, there aren't any letters on my jacket. In fact, I don't even have a jacket. See, in high school, when I went out for baseball, the first thing I heard when I walked onto the field is, it's time for me to make my first cut. Loman, go take a shower. I went out for basketball in college to hear, this is the last uniform. You might as well take it. I was six foot one at the time and I weighed 139 pounds. The uniform was made for Kareem and I ran onto the floor with the pants held up with safety pins. 
I've never had a good relationship with coaches, and even to this day, I have a hard time talking to almost all of them, kind of, we're in a different universe attitude. Not to put anyone down, because I think our coaching staff has improved a lot this year, but I think we got a real jewel in Coach Whitaker. As he told me, he believes sports should be a growing experience. If you don't know what he means by that, you weren't at the game Friday night. But if you were at the games, you know what he means. The man deserves a lot of credit. Let's leave it at that. See, and the challenge for Todd Whitaker, just like the challenge for each person in this room, isn't accumulating things like this in our attaboy and attagirl files. The challenge for Todd Whitaker, just like the challenge for each person in this room, is when we get tired, when we get worn out, going to our attaboy and attagirl file and opening it up. And for me, it's reading that column in the cards and letters that I still get from Bob Fiddler. See, because I'm going to ask you to do me one favor this school year, just one favor. Every morning, I want you to go in the bathroom and look in the mirror, and I want you to remind yourself that you have chosen the single most important profession that there is. And I want you to remind yourself that that profession truly is a wonderful life. See, y'all need to know something. I don't write books like What Great Teachers Do Differently for people like you. See, I write books like What Great Teachers Do Differently about people like you. And I know for a fact that this school year, when the students walk through the doors of your classes and they walk through the doors of your schools, they are gonna be absolutely blessed that each one of you are going to be there to greet them. Thank you for choosing education, taking time out of your busy schedule. Have a great school year, and if I can ever help you, give me a holler. Thank you all so much, I appreciate it.